I'm Ari Redboard, and this is TRM Talks. I am Global Head of Policy at TRM Labs. At TRM, we provide blockchain intelligence software to support law enforcement investigations and to help financial institutions and cryptocurrency businesses mitigate financial crime risk within the emerging digital asset economy. Prior to joining TRM, I spent 15 years in the U.S. federal government, first as a prosecutor at the Department of Justice, and then as a Treasury Department official, where I worked to safeguard the financial system against terrorist financiers, weapons of mass destruction proliferators, drug kingpins, and other rogue actors. On TRM Talks, I sit down with business leaders, policymakers, investigators, and friends from across the crypto ecosystem who are working to build a safer financial system. Today, I sit down with author, journalist, and friend, Emily Parker. But first, Inside the Lab, where I share data-driven insights from our blockchain intelligence team. On a recent Inside the Lab, we dug into blockchain intelligence and how tools like TRM are used by investigators, regulators, and compliance professionals to trace funds and mitigate risk by leveraging the native qualities of public blockchains, transparent, traceable, immutable. But there is another benefit. Open blockchains allow us to measure impact in ways we cannot in the traditional financial system. When I was at Treasury, there was a focus on measuring impact of a sanctions action in order to understand the efficacy of sanctions. In other words, do these sanctions work? That is hard. However, in cases involving cryptocurrencies, we're able to more readily measure impact because we have a real-time view of sanctioned entities. For example, understanding the controversy around OFAC sanctioning of Tornado Cash, the designation succeeded in radically reducing usage of the service. According to TRM, the overall volume passing through Tornado Cash decreased by close to 85% post sanctions. Perhaps most importantly, North Korea hackers appear to have largely abandoned the service in favor of other mixers. Similarly, in November 2023, OFAC sanctioned Bitcoin mixer Sinbad, calling the service a key money laundering tool of North Korea's OFAC designated Lazarus Group. Following Treasury's designation of Sinbad, the mixing service essentially shut down operations. Finally, in January 2023, the DOJ and Treasury announced a coordinated action against non compliant Hong Kong registered crypto exchange Bitslato and the arrest of its owner for conducting a money transmitting business that transported and transmitted illicit funds and that failed to meet U.S. regulatory safeguards. According to TRM, over the course of its existence, Bitslato laundered nearly $2.5 billion in cryptocurrency. Treasury's designation, along with the concurrent law enforcement action, caused a 99% reduction in incoming volume, essentially putting an end to the exchange. When we think about blockchain intelligence, it is not just to mitigate risk, but also to measure and understand it. This can really change the game when it comes to measuring the impact of sanctions, enforcement actions, seizures, arrests, and other activity. In other words, blockchain intelligence doesn't just help law enforcement and regulators trace and track the flow of funds. It can also help them understand whether or not their actions are effective and whether or not to repeat those actions. All right, now let's sit down with Emily Parker. Emily, thank you so much for joining TRM Talks today. Thanks for having me. Uh, We'd love to kind of hear a little bit about your journey. How did you end up in this space as, obviously, as a journalist focused on cryptocurrency, traveling the world? Go back as far as you're willing. How did this all start? Sure. Okay. So I won't go back to like birth, but I go back to just post birth is fine. Post birth. Yeah. Post birth, post birth, like toddler. I would say that the key parts of the journey probably did start in high school because in high school is when I started studying Chinese. And I get this question all the time like, why did you start studying Chinese in high school? And there really wasn't any super compelling reason. I just liked languages and Chinese seemed like a cool language to learn. So I got involved with China very early. I went to China right after high school. In college, I studied abroad in China. So I got involved with Asia, you know, relatively early on. And then after graduating from college, I went and I lived in Japan for a couple of years. I ended up studying martial arts there. And then I came back to the U.S. I got a master's at Harvard in East Asian studies, mainly trying to bring like Chinese and Japanese more to like a 
more fine tuned level because a lot of those languages I learned sort of like out in the world and I wanted to, you know, bring it more to a, a more professional level. After that, I went to the Wall Street Journal. I was covering Asia from Hong Kong. I was at the New York Times for a little bit. And then I took like a pretty long break from journalism per se. Basically, what I wanted to do was write a book. And so this is kind of where the crypto connection comes in, because when I was at the Wall Street Journal, I became very interested in looking at the role of the internet in, in China. And specifically, you know, this idea of like, as we know very well, this idea of a you know, somewhat decentralized technology and how that has an inherent tension with a government like China's, right? And, you know, what was interesting about China and the internet is that from the very early days, there was always a lot of control over the internet in China, and there were always people getting around those controls. And I just became really interested in the story. And so when I came back to the US, I thought, if this is happening in China, it's probably happening in other countries as well. And so my book ended up being about China, Cuba, and Russia. It's called Now I Know Who My Comrades Are. It took like 10 years. I spent you know, a lot of time on the ground in those places, basically talking to the internet activists that were trying to sort of use the internet tools they had, even in a very constrained environment. I guess conceptually, that's how I got interested in this idea of like technology versus government. While I was sort of doing that book stuff, I took a break. I and mean, this is a weird break, but I went to the State Department. <laughs> because an opportunity arose there. And it's like, I had been doing all this stuff overseas. And it's like, well, at, at that moment in time, the US was really interested in using the internet as a tool of foreign policy. So I kind of got to sort of see it from, you know, the home side for a while. And so I did that. And then, yeah, and then the book came out. I did a bunch of other things, you know, did a couple startup ventures. I also noticed that crypto was starting to really gain popularity in China. And I also noticed that, of course, you know, Chinese authorities seemed very uncomfortable with this. So I was like, OK, this is the next level of this game, right? You know, I've sort of been watching this sort of decentralization of information, China trying to crack down. Now we're looking at decentralization of money and China trying to crack down. And so I really wanted to go to China and just see what was going on. It was pretty much as I suspected. It was like there was this sort of booming crypto culture and government was not into it, but it also kind of like didn't matter. I mean, I, I don't want to downplay China's crackdown on crypto because it's real, but it's never stopped. Crypto trading has never stopped in China. And so that's where I met eventual business partners. We started a blockchain company called Loghash that was focused on the Asia market. I did that for a few years and then I ended up at Coindesk. We're going to unpack so much right now, Emily, because that, that's like that. That's amazing. I think there, there are a couple of themes that it's fun. And that is one, like you never know what you're going to do. You do something crazy in high school or college. And then but all of a sudden it just feels very consistent. Right. Years later, like everything that you just described just built on each other to put you in that place as a really unique subject matter expert on crypto in this region. One thing I have to ask is martial arts. Somehow I knew that was going to be the first question. That was the first question. I was like, all right. So yeah, like, let's get a little bit more granular there. Um, like, don't bury the lead. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just what, the what, what kind and like, whose ass did, were you kicking over there? What what, what what was going on? So the martial art was is called Shorinji Kempo. I never thought of myself as like a martial arts person. But, you know, I think that, that just being able to study it in Japan where it's taken so seriously. Um, the people in, in the dojo where I was, like this was a major part of their lives. Practice was several times a week. I mean, you really had to delegate like a lot of time and a lot of effort to it. And what was cool about it was that it wasn't just like a physical practice. There was a lot of kind of like philosophy in there. You know, when you sort of were taking your tests to get the next bell, you had to like write something and you had to show that you sort of understood these kind of like philosophical concepts behind the martial arts. So yeah, it was a really cool experience, but it was harsh. I mean, it was it was harsh. What sounds like too is cool is that like you you obviously embrace this region and in places like mm. China and Hong Kong and, and elsewhere, but it's part of it is the culture, right? So like the fact that yeah. you leaned in to something that is obviously very important to a lot of people there, I think probably helped you in your work as a journalist as well over there, right? I think you're right. I think it was like a very sort of like early immersion an early kind of view into like the way things work. Even though in many of the later years that I went back to Japan and I was spending more time in Tokyo, I realized like that experience in Kyoto wasn't necessarily representative of the way most people in Japan operate. The other thing I wanted to ask more career-wise is you mentioned obviously Russia, Cuba, China, right? Totalitarian regimes where you're reaching out and having conversations with dissidents and activists how does one do that in those places? It was really, really tough. All three countries were tough in different ways. I think the country where I felt the most scared, and I, I write about this a lot in the book, it was Cuba, actually. Just because, as you know well, Cuba has a lot of other factors, for example, a very strange relationship with the United States. And so, you know, it was very clear to me that if something went wrong there, I wouldn't necessarily have, you know, the protection of a U.S. citizen that you might have in, in other countries. 
So yeah, no, I think there was, there was a lot of paranoia in Cuba. There was a lot of, what are you doing here? I mean, you really had to sort of be committed to the story. And it, it kind of freaked me out every time I went to these countries. I think the reason why I kept going is because the people that I met were so interesting. And like the people that I met, especially in a place like Cuba that put so much at risk. And I mean, this is going to sound cheesy, but it's really true. They put so much at risk, literally just for the sake of free expression. Like it would have been just so much easier for them to just kind of go with the flow. And they were sort of writing these blogs and and, you know, there wasn't a lot of internet penetration in Cuba. So most of their stuff was being read overseas and they were gaining some traction overseas, but in great, great personal risk. You know, like two of the people that I profiled my book were sort of these Cuban lawyers that were just like really committed to exposing what they saw as like abuses of justice in Cuba. They were just still like to this day, some of the most amazing people I've met because they really, look, I'll be honest here. Like I've met a lot of these sort of like internet activist celebrities. They're not always in it for like the best reasons, right? Because there's a lot of fame that comes with it. There's a lot of like clout that comes with it. Like that some of the people I met in Cuba specifically, I felt like they were really doing it because out of like a sense of justice, like they weren't doing it to get famous. They weren't doing it to like get more Twitter followers or, or, or whatever it was. So, you know, you really see like in the internet activist world, again, the motivations are, are very different depending on where you go. How are you thinking about Asia right now when it comes to crypto? I guess I came into this world and like the kind of through line of my work is this tension between technology and governments. And that's sort of how I got into crypto. It's like, OK, here's this thing that's clearly has like a life of its own. And and it's, you know, Bitcoin, as we know, was sort of invented to be like independent of governments. Obviously, governments aren't super into that idea. So I guess I'm still really interested in that fundamental tension. Like Asia is a fascinating region, as we've talked about before. You know, it's really becoming kind of at the cutting edge of, of regulation. Part of this has to do with the fact that the U.S. is, you know, whatever is the opposite of cutting edge, you know, but we have basically jurisdictions like Singapore. Singapore has kind of been known to it for a while for being very advanced in sort of the digital asset game. But now you have Hong Kong, you have Japan. But like when you look at those jurisdictions closely, you see that there's some idiosyncrasies. For example, like Singapore, you know, is often referred to very casually as like this crypto friendly place. If you spend time in Singapore, I'm sure you notice this. Crypto friendly is not the right word. They don't even like that, right? I mean, if you kind of listen to the statements that the regulators make, they're actually quite wary of crypto, but they like this idea of asset tokenization. And so, um, and China remains really interesting to me again. And I think one of the things people get wrong about China is they think that like China tried to like eradicate crypto entirely. I don't actually think that was their goal. I think their goal was to kind of like raise the barrier to entry, which they did successfully, right? They just wanted to make it harder for people to gain access to trade because it was just kind of like spreading like wildfire, you know? Then you have Hong Kong. I mean, you know, Hong Kong is really trying to position itself as like a digital asset hub. So yeah, I think there's a ton of interesting stuff happening in Asia. Ravi Menon, who was the head of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, he said something like, yes to digital asset innovation, no to speculation. And you wrote this piece, crypto friendly does not mean crypto easy. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at, right? Like we talk about these places wanting to be crypto hubs. Yeah, they want to be crypto hubs, but they are laser focused on advertising and consumer protection and anti-money laundering, right? So like it's, hey, we are embracing the technology to the extent that we're willing to regulate it. But just talk me through that a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think what I was getting at is that we tend to use this term crypto friendly really kind of casually. It's like, oh, you know, Hong Kong is crypto friendly. Japan is crypto friendly. Singapore is crypto friendly. And I think we just need to be more clear about what the term crypto friendly actually means. And, and so I think like a better term is probably like crypto clear. You can't have a bank account in Japan today if you're a cryptocurrency business, right? But on the flip side, they've been really thoughtful around regulation, conservative, but thoughtful. A lot of it, too, is like in contrast to the United States. I mean, the United States is definitely not crypto friendly or crypto easy or crypto clear, any of those things. Right. But I think, you know, what what makes the U.S. not crypto friendly isn't that the rules are so tough. It's that the rules are confusing. And so, you know, in Asia, I think it's considered friendly. And, you know, I've heard about this for Singapore for many, many years. I mean, again, Singapore was a, a real early mover uh, in digital assets. And, and when you ask people like, why do you want to go to Singapore or what attracts you to Singapore? They say, oh, OK, I know what the rules are. I know who to talk to. There's like a consultative process with MAS. But I think, again, if you look closely, I mean, especially, you know, look at Japan, look at Hong Kong, look at the rules for exchanges. They're really, really tough. I mean, some of the toughest in the world. I think this is going to be a really interesting tension in the years to come because, I mean, Japan was a first mover in crypto. Then it kind of like moved out of the game. Now it's back. But their rules are really tough and people criticize their rules for being tough. Hong Kong is tough, too. I mean, Hong Kong has like really strict rules, you know, on custody and and. There's a very limited numbers of exchanges that can, you know, serve retail in, in Hong Kong. And so I think we're going to see over the next few years, like 
if they're tough or if they're too tough, but they have to dial that back a little bit. You know, and it's funny because when I go to Asia, I mean, I talk to regulators and ex-regulators, they, they basically say to me, please tell people that it's not easy here because otherwise they're going to come and be very disappointed. I think it's like just one of those things where there's like a lot of very casual language floating around that doesn't necessarily reflect the reality. And to crypto businesses credit, they are really looking for clarity, right? The rules of the mm-hmm. road when they're engaging. I think that's why Mika in Europe has been so successful. Honestly, why Singapore has been so successful because at least they set forth the rules. Like, yes, you care what they are, but arguably care even more about just having a speed limit, right? A lot of it is in contrast to the United States where it's like, the US is gray, but that doesn't help anybody. Like that doesn't make it easy. What it means is that actually a lot of companies and projects end up just wasting a lot of time and money, you know, embroiled in like lawsuits or, you know, worrying about if they're, you know, not knowing if they're doing something right or doing something wrong. The disadvantages of that model have become very, very clear. You know, just because like just because there are gray areas in the U.S. doesn't mean like you can do whatever you want. It just means you don't know what you can and cannot do. Most likely you cannot do it. So I think, you know, a lot of companies and projects have learned this the hard way. I often will say to folks when they ask questions around the U.S., a couple of years ago, I'm not sure I would have told you with certainty that every branch of the U.S. government would be deeply engaged with crypto today. Mm. Right. I mean. Mm -hmm. Every Mm -hmm. federal court is sort of grappling with this up to ultimately, you know, obviously high appellate courts and maybe soon the Supreme Court. You have legislation that's at least been voted out of committee. We'll see how far that goes. Who knows? And then obviously you see every regulator in the U.S. deeply engaged with this stuff. The SEC, the CFTC, Treasury's had a playbook for years on sanctions and enforcement actions. But like that's something I, I think is pretty extraordinary. And I know we don't have the clarity that maybe some people want on one question, right? Like, is it a security or is it a commodity and who's going to regulate it? I feel like we can't kind of get over ourselves with that by just answer that fundamental question. Yeah. That's kind of my high level view of the US. How do you think about the US when you're hearing from folks? I feel like it's like the one thing that a lot of people in the crypto industry agree on. And, you know, they don't agree on a lot of things. It's just that whatever's going on in the US is just not working that well. There are a lot of agencies that are focused on crypto, but they're not coordinated. The real interesting question is, you know, now we have these Bitcoin ETFs and if that's going to change anything in in the U.S. Because it's like very mixed signals. It's like for, you know, literally years, the community has been talking about how unfriendly the U.S., you know, is to crypto. But then the U.S. and specifically the SEC just made a decision that I think, you know, is pretty widely acknowledged to have basically helped the price of Bitcoin and ushered in what some people think will be a new bull market. I was personally sort of saying, hey, I get this is good for the industry. This is good for Bitcoins, price of Bitcoin. But what about that ethos? And there just wasn't a lot of discussion. And then you wrote this piece for Coindesk that in very many respects encapsulated the way I was thinking about it. And that is like, this is undeniably a good thing, but I still feel a little bad about it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Would you explain to folks sort of what your take was and and maybe a little bit about that piece? And just honestly, like from a philosophical perspective, someone who believes in this technology and the promise of it, how, you know, you're sort of grappling with this. Yeah, I think you just framed that really well. And, you know, of course, I'm, I'm actually glad to have the opportunity to talk about this because with a piece like that, people just look at the headline and they think, you know, that I'm saying, oh, it's so awesome. Wall Street's here, you know, <laughs> which is not, yeah. not what I was saying at all. I mean, the piece was very much about this inherent tension. You know, you look at Bitcoin, you look at the white paper, you look at just like not even the white paper, you look at like the executive summary of the white paper, you know, the, the real top, like what is the point of this? And the whole point of Bitcoin is to, you know, get rid of third party intermediation. It's to be independent of governments and independent of banks. You know, I mean, this is this is something that came on the heels of the financial crisis. I mean, the philosophy behind Bitcoin could not be clearer. And it's something that really attracted me to it. Like, I thought that was so cool. It's like this alternative money system, you know. And now we have this situation like an ETF is basically pretty much everything that the white paper is not. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I mean, it's like third-party institutions, it's fees, it's Wall Street, you know, you basically had the SEC had to approve it. So it's basically all the things that Bitcoin is not supposed to be. But what's interesting about it, as you've noticed, is like for the most part, you know, with a few exceptions, the crypto community has been celebrating this, not just celebrating it, but like anxiously awaiting this ETF for, for years. So it's like, Hmm, like how do you sort of, you know, square that? We've seen basically over the past couple of years, you know, we've had the combination of like a bear market. We've had these sort of like really bad rogue actors, you know, like Sam bankman fried you know, you've had the U.S. government sort of cracking down. You've had, you know, Gary Gensler being, you know, pretty unfriendly to crypto. And you see that like it just makes it hard for the entire industry, you know, Korea, and um, terrorist financing. We could keep going with that. <laughs> we could keep going. We yeah. could keep going. And it's like it's like, you know, we need Bitcoin ETFs to save the industry. I mean, I don't know. It's like I wouldn't go that far. But like clearly the fact that everybody was just like 
anxiously awaiting this. It's like, you know, this sort of like mainstream adoption that everybody's talking about. It's, crypto was sort of the industry was just going down a very, very difficult path. And it was like everybody or not everybody, but many, many projects were getting swept into it. Because when you have, you know, unfriendly governments and when you have widespread distrust and when you have consumers not wanting to get into it and, you know, it's hard for these smaller projects to raise funds. It's hard for everybody, you know? And so I guess like the hope is, is that like this ETF, you know, puts like a, a stamp of legitimacy on the industry, which like gives people a little bit more breathing room without actually having Wall Street's culture define it. Because I think, yeah, I think that would be sort of sad and that would be kind of problematic. So I'm just kind of hoping that this turns into something of like mutual coexistence, right? It's like, okay, so there's these ETFs and there's kind of Wall Street and they're doing their thing. And then that just gives a little more breathing room for the more sort of like decentralized, pure crypto ethos companies or projects to thrive. Obviously, you're so focused on these really interesting philosophical questions, and I think really important ones. The one that I think probably the most about is this idea of privacy and security. We need to find a way to balance and, and enable lawful users of this technology a degree of privacy in a more and more open financial system, right, where every transaction is traceable and transparent and immutable on a public ledger. But at the same time, none of this works from a national security perspective, even from an ecosystem perspective, if North Korea continue to hack, you know, and steal 600 million from a DeFi bridge or from a protocol and, and, and launder those funds. So you're constantly kind of like walking that line between privacy and security. How do you think about that kind of question in crypto from a philosophical perspective? I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think you look at this more closely than I do. I mean, I think when you get into that, the, those sort of more niche areas, like I don't think anybody's found a good solution to this or privacy coins. There's very different views about those all over the world. You know, I think it's in some places, it's very hard for them to exist. There's interesting work being done in this area. Like I think zero knowledge proofs are really, really interesting. I don't totally understand why they're not more like widely accepted. To me, it seems like a no-brainer. Like this seems like a really, you know, this would solve a lot of problems, but still they're they're definitely not at a level of mass awareness or mass use, you know? I mean, that to me, and again, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, but that always seems like a promising technology. But yeah, it's not easy. It's not an easy problem to solve. I think you think we think about it exactly the same way. I've always believed there are technology solutions. I think TRM today, blockchain intelligence, we're solving for a lot of this. But in the more centralized world, we work with every major exchange. We work with law enforcement to track and trace funds. But when you're talking about like the protocol layer, bad actors can still go around the front end to the protocol. And I think that that's where digital ID, zero knowledge proofs, these these sort of things that I think more nascent. And when you argue that to a regulator, they're like, but it's still yeah. not there yet. <laughs> and that's yeah. and that's always, that's kind of the frustration of the conversation for sure. But, you know, you see the same sort of trade-off between kind of like privacy and convenience that we've seen this in the entire internet age, right? Like, for example, it's like, there are plenty of people who, you know, probably are aware that it's it's more private or you have better protections if you're using your own wallet, but they're still going through the big exchanges just because like it's easier. But yeah, when you sign up for an exchange, when you create an account at a crypto exchange, I mean, it's not that different from a bank account. I mean, you're giving them tons of information. There's nothing private about that, you know, and that's how a lot of people access this market. And they're they kind of know that and they're still making that trade off because, you know, they don't want to like have the responsibility of doing everything kind of like, you know, they lose their password or, or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I think some people are, you know, kind of willingly making that trade off just because it's like more convenient, more easy. And we've seen this with the Internet all along. One of the really interesting things I've seen in the U.S., and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about this, at least over the past years, maybe this is changing, but people have such a different attitude about privacy when it comes to private companies or the government. And you see this a lot in just like kind of like a lot of the um, panic about central bank digital currencies. It's like, OK, if the government in some way is, you know, asking me for information or running a program, like people go into like high alert and they, you know, they freak out. And But if it's like a private company that has like, you know, huge terms of service with, you know, four point font or whatever, you know, they'll just be like, sure, whatever, just just take it, you know. And this is just this is just something that I find really, really interesting that there's like in the U.S., and I think it's very different in other countries, but in the U.S., there's like a, a real widespread distrust of government and like too much trust in private companies, you know? So, um, and I think that plays into this industry as well. It makes perfect sense. And you see it all the time. Like I have long ago given up privacy for convenience, right? We all have. I mean, mm. oh my gosh. Yeah. There's no privacy on the internet. Yeah. But it is interesting that like when it comes to governments, and I don't know if it's like 
there's not a lot of things that governments make more convenient. So people, there's no trade to be done. It's just like, you, you know, you just want your privacy. But like, if, if I want to buy sneakers, less like I private, want to- Less private, less convenient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah, what is it? They, they make it easier for me to file my taxes. Like, there's nothing that they make yeah. easy. Yeah, so, that's a good like, point. So there's no trade off that you have to make. But it's, yeah, I, it, it is it's kind of a cynical point though. And I'm not really a cynical yeah. person. But it's like, you know, I, I can't figure it out either, you know, for sure. It's really interesting to see how like the central bank digital currency issue has been elevated. And I wrote about this a long time ago because I kind of was watching it build to sort of a presidential campaign issue. I mean, we're going to hear about this more probably, which is crazy because, well, not crazy, but it's surprising because as of now, the U.S. doesn't really have plans to create one. I think some people are suspicious of that. They think the U.S. does secretly have plans to create one. But it's interesting, like, I mean, if you looked at the DeSantis campaign, obviously that's over, but like he spent, you know, a decent amount of time and energy on this issue. And I think it resonated with voters. It's like people really saw this as like a very nefarious thing. And that's why politicians have picked up on it. So I I have a feeling we're going to hear about this again. You mentioned sort of like some really cool areas that you've investigated as a journalist and some other things. What are like the highlights? You mentioned talking to activists and other folks. First sort of highlight overall, and then would like to hear like, what is the coolest sort of crypto story that you've covered? Yeah. So, I mean, I think honestly, like the the biggest story that I've done in my career, the longest story was was my book, because that was just really like, just so, I and here's basically the TLDR of, of this book, which I still kind of believe in, because, you know, there's been so much backlash to social media and the internet since then. And it was just basically what my book was about was just looking at sort of like the transformative power on individuals, right? Like these individuals that sort of grew up in sort of repressive environments. And then for the first time, they sort of like find their people, you know, via social media, via the internet, via their blog, whatever it is. But yeah, I think just sort of meeting those individuals. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and I get questions about this a lot because there's a lot of people all the time who say things like, you know, social media is a net negative. It's bad for America. And I think in the U.S. context, it's easy to kind of feel that way. But I think, again, even if you look at like a country like China, I never said, you know, social media is going to change China's form of government. China is definitely a very different place with social media and internet than it was before. You know, I just don't think you can argue otherwise. It has had a transformative impact on China, but just not the transformation that some people in the West wanted and expected. So I would say that like, that's the big story. But there's like, I was actually thinking about this, this question. And there's definitely some little stories I've done over the years, like kind of random ones that still stick with me. So for example, like when I was at the Wall Street Journal, just kind of, this wasn't really like part of my main thing, but I would interview a lot of like artists and writers and directors, just whoever. And one of the people who I interviewed during that time was Daniel Day-Lewis, which was super random because actually his people came to me. He was like promoting a movie. I respect him. He's a great actor, but like, I'm not into his movies. They're not my thing, you know? So I was just like, oh, but this, I was like, this is Last culture. Why not Eakins. interview uh, it's not, oh, it's but, not my, it's not my scene. It's not my scene. I'm just gonna, I right, respect right, them. Right. I respect them because right. I like had to watch. So I was like, oh no, like I better watch all these movies now. Like I don't even know if I'd seen any of them. So I was like, you know, watch all the movies, but I was like, yeah, I'll do this. It seems interesting. And I have to say to this day, I feel like I think about that interview all the time. Like he, um, it had nothing to do with anything else that I'm working on. Like, and, or, but it, it, he just was really smart and he just had like a few things like, I remember asking him, I was like, oh, you know, people call you like a serious actor. And he was like, yeah, he's like, I think the seriousness of the work kind of allows me to sort of recognize like the absurdity of what I'm doing. Like he had kind of said, he's like, is this really a seemly thing to be doing to like be dressing up in other people's clothes? Like he had kind of like a sense of humor about the whole thing, which does not come across in his performances. You know, he's also like, he was a cabinet maker. I don't know. So yeah, there were like these random people that kind of came across my radar. Um, And for some reason, again, like I've met so many different people and I've interviewed so many people, but I'm like, often think about Daniel Day-Lewis and like some of the stuff he said. I'm like, you know, like I... I was on to something, you know. I love that. That's so, <laughs> so cool. And, you know, it yeah. goes to show you, like, I think that we know so, oftentimes, like, someone's public persona or sort of, you know, and, and then you meet them and you have, like, an entirely different view. What are you psyched about right now? Like, what intrigues you in terms of stories that you're you're looking at or, or you're covering? Good question. I think, let's just be honest here. I think the biggest story right now in the U.S. is the election. And it's funny because I feel like people were sort of tuned out of it or just, like, in denial of it. And now you're starting to see it ramp up. But, like, this is a crazy situation that we might have a rematch. And that's, like, that looks like we're likely Never ever rematch. I have to just like say that at the front, like that is the bit, that is a huge story. It's nuts. Look, there's a lot of people being like, the bull market's coming back. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot more optimism. The real question is like Asia's, you know, it's clear where Asia's going. I think the question is the U.S. now, like, you know, with the, these ETFs, you know, I think the U.S., again, there's a sort of contradiction of the U.S. has been sort of like the bad cop in crypto. But now, you know, the U.S. is sort of widely acknowledged to be, have contributed greatly to this big bump in prices. 
So where is the U.S. going, I think is interesting. I think RWA tokenization stuff, like I think it's interesting in theory. I want to see more of this stuff actually in practice, you know, and sort of see like, is there actually like a there there? I think there's a big question about that, you know. Um, So yeah, I think those are some of the bigger themes. It seems like People are pretty optimistic about like prices and stuff. But like, again, what the sort of like trickle down effects of of that are going to be, I don't know. Awesome. For our listeners, and people are pretty deep who listen to this podcast, but RWA is like uh, real world assets. So talking about like sort of anything that's tokenized in the real world, Mm -hmm. they're really, really interesting conversations. But at the end of the day, the US dollar, (laughs) maybe that's the only example of a real world asset that's been tokenized to any sort of like degree. But yeah, I mean, that's the power of the blockchain potentially, right? So I, I agree. I think it's a really cool story. I think today we're almost at like ground zero other than stable coins. It's definitely like the new, I mean, you know, you saw you saw that in Singapore, right? It feels like the new hot thing, you know? And, and as we know, like hot things in crypto can go either way, right? Like, is this going to stick around? I'm curious. I mean, there's definitely a lot of really big players involved in it, both governments and banks. And so, you know, there's a lot invested in it, but I'm I'm, I'm a little curious to see where that's going to go. You're one of the few people who travels way more than I do. Like, it's amazing. You are everywhere. A, like, what are your favorite places to go to? And then this is just like the pro tip. Like, what are your jet lag moves? You know, mine mm-hmm. is mine is yeah. running. They say not to drink caffeine or alcohol. I, I do. I, I do both. So like I do running and I pair it with beer and, and coffee. And that's usually sort of like sort of works at some point. But what do you do? I mean, I wish I had a magic solution. I will say this. I feel like jet lag is always worse coming back to the U.S. than going to Asia. I mean, the caffeine thing is actually pretty huge because definitely like in my earlier days of travel, I used to sort of like fight jet lag with caffeine, which is the worst thing to do. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I'm getting tired. It's 2 p.m. I'm flagging at 5 p.m. I'll just drink some coffee. And then it just like it definitely like makes it longer and more painful. So I have, I think that's probably like the main thing I've tweaked is the caffeine thing. I don't know. I just try to do the things that they say you're going to do. You're supposed to do like, you know, get sunlight during the day, you know, exercise. But there's always a few days where you're you know, up at 3 a.m. like questioning the meaning of life, you know. <laughs> you know? Um, it's good. Like, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, like, thankfully, like I know so many people on different, you know, parts of the world that there's usually somebody else up at that time. One of the reasons I love Singapore is because it's probably the only country I've ever been to in the world where I could get up at like three or four o'clock in the morning and go running from a safety and climate perspective, That's true. Yeah. which is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really yeah. surreal to be running around past these giant yeah. shopping centers and stuff at like four o'clock and there's yeah. no one out there, but it it is safe. Yeah, that's true. So, so then we're talking running, hobbies, interests, things that like kind of like keep you from, from going crazy on this ridiculous crypto ecosystem? It's ridiculous. I mean, look, I think for everybody in crypto is like, make sure you have family and friends that don't care about crypto at all. You know, like you need people to like put it in perspective because like crypto people can get into these like spirals. Like you need to have at least a few people in your life that are like, I really don't care about this. Um, yeah, I like to run too. Again, not not at six in the morning. Yeah, just anything you can do that's like active, that sort of like gets you out of your head, you know, running, I do yoga, you know, stuff like that, I think is really important. Like anything that gets me away from my phone, my computer, you know, things like that. Uh, one thing that I really like doing, this is going to sound kind of nerdy, but I, I really like reading in Japanese. I try to read Japanese novels and there's some really cool fiction coming out of Japan. And I don't know, I find that actually very like meditative. It's like the act of like deciphering the text. Amazing. I would love to hang in Japan at some point. I was there this spring. I went to a Yomiuri Giants game, which was like a lifetime thrill as a baseball fan. Food was amazing. Just the whole experience was fantastic. So yes, I got to find myself there. We can go running any time of day or night. Yeah. You want. yeah, yeah. It'll, I, it'll, actually, I yeah. love I love running in Tokyo. Thank you so much, Emily. Not surprised at all about how fun this was, but like really awesome conversation and super grateful to have you on and to be in the space with you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Emily is one of these people I feel like I've literally seen all over the world. That combination of of Emily, the journalist, but that also Emily, the person who's had deep conversations with dissidents and other folks, the things that we talk about in the crypto space or that libertarian ethos isn't just academic, the importance to be able to transfer value outside of the traditional financial system in places like China, Cuba, Iran, North Korea. It just all becomes very, very real. And I think that was, quite frankly, the real takeaway I had from the conversation is like, this is someone who this is very real for. And I think that really informs the work that she does around regulation, around covering the space. Next on TRM Talks, I sit down with Jana Ringwald from Frankfurt's Prosecutor General's Office to talk investigating cryptocurrency and cybercrime cases. 
If you love the show, leave a review wherever you're listening to it. For more crypto insights, you can also subscribe to the TRM Weekly Roundup at trmlabs.com. TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. This episode was produced in partnership with Voltage Productions. The music for this show was provided by Ecolix. Now, let's get back to building. Building.